Chapter 17 McGuinness looked up eagerly as the door slid open, hoping that Crespi had gotten the code slate. He'd been gone longer than she thought he'd be, and she was starting to feel anxious, a dull ache of worry low in her gut. He stood in the door then, and she spoke quickly, relieved to see him. Did you get it, sir? She trailed off. He'd been in some kind of fight. His clothes were ripped in places. His grim face was bleeding. She opened her mouth to ask, to see if he was all right. He stalked across the room, right at her, and she saw at the last second that he didn't mean to stop. Crespi grabbed at her shoulders, her clothes, and dug his fingers into her flesh, hard. No, what are you doing? His hands went to her throat. He pushed her back, slammed her body up against the wall. What the hell happened down there? He was furious, his voice low and dripping with hatred. You sent me down there to die, didn't you? Didn't you? McGuinness struggled for air, clawed at his iron grip. What are you... Stop it, you're hurting me. His dark eyes were almost black with anger. I'll hurt you, all right. I'll hurt you. His grip tightened, and dark shadows began to swim across her vision. She could barely speak now, her words choked and raspy. Didn't... No, I didn't. Killing me. He suddenly let her go, and she fell to the floor, choking for air. His words seemed distant, far away. You set me up, McGuinness, you worthless traitor. I should kill you. McGuinness crawled to her hands and knees, raised herself up. No, she whispered and coughed, the sensation agonizing, but the confusion somehow worse. No. She looked up at him, and he must have seen the innocence in her face. He still glowered down at her, angrier than she'd ever seen a grown man, but he stopped shouting. I ought to shoot you on the spot. A fucking drone attacked me. McGuinness felt shock, disbelief. He thought she had. No, she whispered, and the truth was suddenly a bright flash in her mind, the only answer. It was church. Had to be church. You said he was asleep, he scowled. She shook her head, helpless in her own dark astonishment. I don't know, maybe before. Wait. A sudden frantic hope. Did you get the slate? Let me have it, I'll prove I'm right. She stood up. The pain in her throat subsiding to a dull, pulsing ache. She held out her hand, waited, afraid he might attack her again. Or worse, that he wouldn't believe her. His frown deepened, and she could see him try to sort it out to decide. Uncertainty played across his bloodied features, a strange expression on his normally intense and focused face. But he dug into a front pocket and produced the slate. She reached for it, but he gripped it tightly, stared into her eyes, his own cold and hard. You get one chance to show me. I will. I swear I will. He let go of the code slate, and she felt a rush of cool relief. She could prove it had no choice now but to unmask the facts. She turned for the door, eager to show him. Come on, let's get to K-Lab right now. Church will be notified about the attack, and he'll come looking for us. Right now, that sounded a fuck of a lot scarier than any alien drone. If Church was that desperate to unleash one of his creatures, there was no telling what he'd do when he found out that Crespi was still alive. Crespi paused to grab his weapon, eyes unreadable now and then they were out into the corridor, hurrying to the lowest level of the station. She wished vainly that she'd thought to bring her own weapon, but there was no time, and Crespi didn't look like he'd be willing to wait. She held the slate tightly, afraid she'd lose it somehow as they jogged through the twisting corridors and into the lift that would take them to the secret lab. This was her only chance. If she was wrong, they'd be hell to pay. Crespi followed McGuinness through the still dim passageways, his body aching with a pain he hadn't known in years and years. He was torn, uncertain, and he hated that even more than the physical suffering. But the worst, I don't know who to trust anymore. His instincts were dead. He couldn't find his gut center, the tiny voice that had always told him which path to take. He couldn't trust himself. He was too tired and too hurt to find his own way through this. He'd believed in her, and he had been wrong, hadn't he? 
McGuinness said she could prove her story. And so he followed her, perhaps to his own death at her treacherous hands, or by churches, or some fucking drone, oblivious to the cares of men, not giving a shit for hope or loss or fear, not caring if you'd grown old and out of touch with what was real and what was smiling deceit. And would that be so bad, Crespi? You've been living on borrowed time ever since that rock near Solano's moon, and you know it. Suddenly it all came together, the memories, the nagging anxiety he'd felt from the moment out of deep sleep. He did know it, and had known deep down all along, no matter how he tried to bury the truth beneath his work. Since he'd come here, it had all resurfaced, haunting him at every turn, refusing to be pushed away any longer. He'd made a career far away from that horrible morning, had let the fear fester in the darkness of his deepest heart, that he didn't deserve to be the only one left and that someday there would be a price to pay for it. Except here it was, finally. And the funny thing was, after avoiding it for so long, right now it didn't seem so scary after all. If there was a price to pay, now was as good as time as any. And maybe, when it was your time to go, you just went. Maybe he'd stayed alive until he could understand that. And perhaps, when you lost that little voice inside, you were just done. That's the spirit. Why don't you just give up now, save everyone else the trouble? Fuck that shit. He was too tired. His mind was playing tricks. He stopped thinking and tried to concentrate on keeping up. After an eternity of gloomy hallways and wrong turns, they stopped in front of a huge metal circle, an unlabeled door at the end of the lowest deck. The corridor was grimy, probably hadn't been cleaned in years, but the door was polished and gleaming. There were no handles, no bioscan, no guard. It looked solidly impenetrable. Only a small slot to one side. A slate plug. McGuinness fumbled with the code slate, echoed his own thoughts aloud. This is absolutely impassable without a key code, which we've got right here. He could see the finger-shaped bruises on her neck and wondered if he should feel guilty, if she was innocent. He just didn't know. Maybe that's the price, Doctor. Maybe payment time has come. He had a sudden urge to shoot himself in the head, just to stop his brain from taunting him any longer. He laughed, a short bark of humorless sound. <laughs> Wouldn't that take the prize? He'd slayed the mighty dragon with a can of hairspray, just to off himself in a fit of existential angst. McGuinness looked at him nervously, but he shook his head and motioned for her to go on. Hold on. Not much longer. She inserted the slate, frowned, punched a button. The door sighed open, swinging outward, revealing another door just inside. She repeated the process. This one took two tries, but finally it opened into another small passage. Last door. Crespi pulled his weapon, held it down but ready. He would go out fighting at least, if it came to that. The heavy door swung open in a rush of cool, moist air, revealing Church's private lab. No, McGuinness breathed the word that seemed to sum up the horrible impossibility of the place. Crespi stepped forward, his weapon forgotten for the moment, everything forgotten. At last, the truth was painfully apparent. Paul Church was hopelessly, irretrievably mad.